Good afternoon, everybody. It is with uh, great enthusiasm that I have the opportunity to introduce today's grand round speaker, Dr. Catherine Hamilton. Uh, she's a graduate of Princeton University and then went and completed her medical training at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, she then did her uh, internship and residency in neurology at UCSF, followed by a headache fellowship at Montefiore in the Bronx. Um, she has served on the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania in the Department of Neurology and now has joined our faculty here at Georgetown. She practices um, at MedStar Chevy Chase and at Lafayette, and uh, her specialty focus is on the multidisciplinary care of headaches. Um, today, I'm so happy to hear her talk titled Treating Migraines in 2020 with a, a really cute little dog on there. Um, <laughs> Dr. Hamilton, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm excited to be speaking with you all today. Thank you for the invitation. Um, and I'm excited to have recently joined the, the MedStar Neurology Group um, and, and the Headache Group specifically. So the title of my talk is Treating Migraine in 2022. As many of you may be aware of, um, there have been a lot of new treatments for migraine in recent years. Um, so, and, and I think even though migraine is technically a neurologic disease, it, it is so common and something that comes up um, frequently in primary care or in internal medicine. So I think, uh, so I hope that um, by the end of this talk, you have a little bit better sense of what some of these new treatments are and potentially feel more comfortable um, using them, or if not, kind of at least know what's out there and how to get uh, these migraine patients better relief. These are my disclosures. Uh, of note, a disclosure of sort is that I do hail from Philadelphia. That's where I was just practicing. Um, for, for a few years prior to coming here. And some of you may be, may be familiar with Philadelphia and it has this ridiculous mascot for uh, its hockey team. This is, this is gritty. Um, so, you know, you can take what, what a Philadelphian says with, with a grain of salt, I suppose. <laughs> okay, on to the talk. So objectives of the talk. I'm first gonna discuss some of the unmet needs for treatment of migraine. Where are the treatment gaps that we need to fill to help migraine patients? And a large portion of the talk, as I, as I said, is going to be devoted to discussing some of the new acute and preventive treatment options for migraine, because there are a lot. And practically, I want you to get somewhat of a sense of how we incorporate these new treatments, so, you know, how we, as a headache specialist neurologist, how we treat it and how you also can potentially incorporate some of these new treatments into the care of, of migraine patients. So headache and migraine treatment has come a long way. For many, many years, we had very limited options for treating migraine. And I think as a result, migraine kind of has the wrap of being frustrating to treat. Um, but in recent years, in the last 10, or even last few years, there's really been an explosion of new treatment options that have that have been developed in both medications, neuromodulation devices. Um, so it's a really exciting time to be uh, treating migraine and to be in this in this field um, because we just have a lot more options now um, to help patients, and and so it can be it can be quite rewarding. Um, uh, because we we do we do have the potential to really help people uh, get back to functioning well and and get control over their migraines. So I'm going to start off with a case which potentially illustrates um, some of the uh, you know still some of the the gaps in care for for migraine patients. Um, this is a this is Maria. She's a 40 year old woman with asthma. Um, she's had migraines for a long time. Um, they did improve when she was pregnant, but they've worsened in the past few years. And she's now having headache four days out of the week. So very frequent headache. She's taking a lot of Excedrin migraine. This is unfortunately a, a pretty common scenario that uh, we see even as headache specialists. You know, a lot of people suffer with frequent migraines for a long time, um, potentially without even seeking care, ever mentioning it to a doctor. So, um, so uh, you know, a lot of patients are not getting 
really migraine specific treatment or, or effective treatments for, for many, many years. Um, and, and there are a lot of studies that do show um, uh, that, that there's insufficient treatment for, for migraine patients, both on the acute side and the preventive side. So in terms of acute migraine treatment as needed medications, um, many migraine patients are not using migraine specific as needed medications. You know, they're, they're potentially just treating it on their own with over-the-counter medications. And concerningly, many migraine patients are using opioids or barbiturates, um, potentially from what they received in their emergency room. Um, and these, as we all know, have, have concerns over uh, potential for abuse and um, are really not migraine specific. Um, furthermore, studies show that many migraine patients are dissatisfied with their acute treatment. And a more recent study showed that almost 96% of migraine patients reported at least one unmet acute treatment need, meaning something like their acute treatment doesn't work quickly enough. So, so we, we definitely have a lot of room for improvement in, in acute treatments and, and hopefully some of the new acute treatments uh, fill, fill those gaps. On the preventive medication side, uh, preventive treatment side, similarly, a lot of, a lot of room for improvement. Um, studies show that uh, amongst migraine patients who would qualify for preventive treatment, so those having frequent migraines or using frequent as-needed medications, um, only a fraction of those patients are actually um, using preventive medications, meaning that at some point there's a there's a gap in care there, um, uh, and 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 more patients would would qualify pre for preventive treatment than are receiving it, um, and and even being started on a preventive treatment, adherence rates can be very low, um, particularly to the older preventive medications that we use for migraine, like beta blockers or topiramate. Um, you can see this is one study showing adherence rates over time, and there's a significant drop even within the first month of use, and then a continued decline over time to about 25% out after a year. Only 25% are still taking these medications. Um, and this isn't surprising. You know, it, many of you are probably somewhat familiar with these medications. They're not migraine specific, and they can have various side effects. Um, so so, uh, so oftentimes they're, they're discontinued by patients because of lack of tolerability, difficulty taking a daily medication, sort of difficulty understanding why they're taking a, a, a non-specific medication for their migraines. Um, so, so definitely there was a need for many, many years for better preventive treatment as well. Taking a step back and thinking on a more systems level, you know, and this I think is is very applicable to internal medicine, primary care. Um, why, you know, why are patients not getting um, adequate uh, acute and preventive treatments for their migraines when we do have migraine, a lot of migraine specific treatments, especially in recent years? And I think this starts at the level of firstly the patient not seeking care in the first place for their migraines. Um, a lot of patients just kind of power through their headaches, take over the counter medications. And in our, in our uh, culture, I think there's a, a tendency to downplay headaches. So, you know, a lot of expressions like, oh, it's just a headache or what a headache, you know, as, and I don't think patients realize like this is a disease. This is, uh, I have migraine and, and there are migraine specific treatments that I could ask about with my, talk about with my doctor. So that's the first barrier. And then once they do seek care, um, many, many migraine patients are first seeking care with, with their primary care doctor. Um, there, there certainly can be a lack of awareness of treatment options, and that's understandable. There's been a lot of new treatments. It's hard to keep track of all, all of them. Um, but I think it's, so it's important that we, that we educate um, providers at all levels about uh, migraine treatment. Um, and it's important that we have quality guidelines to help guide providers at all levels. Um, uh, also that we counsel patients about side effects or have a sense of side effects so that that is not um, a barrier to them starting a new medication. Going back to our case for Maria, she's taking a lot of Excedrin to the point where she's developing symptoms of gastritis. Um, she has seen her primary care doctor in the past who prescribed sumatriptan. She took it a couple times, didn't really like it. It caused kind of a funny burning sensation in her chest. So she doesn't want to, doesn't want to take that medication again. And ideally doesn't want to take another similar medication in the triptan category. So she wants to know what else she could take. 
first let's think about so so we're going to talk about some of the new newer as needed medications for migraine but just wanted to first discuss really what are the goals of as needed treatment or acute treatment it might might seem kind of obvious but um, i think it's important to to spell out uh, a little bit more uh, so that we we know kind of what you know what we're treating when when the patient's in front of us of course i think most importantly ideally you would have a an acute medication that works uh, quickly and consistently to um, ideally eliminate pain and other bothersome symptoms of migraine like photophobia and nausea um, practically at the end of the day a patient wants with migraine wants to be able to get back to functioning they don't they want to be able to um, abort the migraine so that they can they can continue working or, or don't have to miss an important family event and, and everything like that um, ideally a good acute medication would have minimal need for repeat dosing or, or adding on another medication. Um, it's, it's really important that patients have good as needed options so that it avoids overuse of, of medical care like emergency room visits. I'm sure many of you have seen patients in the emergency room come in with, with migraine. And um, I think with better uh, as needed regimens at home, that, that can be avoided. Um, Ideally, an acute medication would have minimal or no adverse effects and not be cost prohibitive so that a patient actually can, can take it. Um, the American Academy of Neurology has guidelines for both acute and preventive treat, um, migraine treatment, but they're a bit out of date. Uh, this The last guideline for acute treatment was in 2000, but this, this kind of lists the, the typical acute medications that we start with for migraine, um, many of which you, you are probably familiar with. So triptans are still first line um, acute medications that we use for patients. These are, are migraine specific um, and can work very well for, for many patients. NSAIDs also have a high level of evidence for migraine. So that's another category that we still use um, frequently. Um, but these this guideline does not include newer as needed um, treatment. So the American Headache Society uh, more recently developed guidelines for for uh, or developed a consensus statement for acute and preventive migraine medications uh, and and categorize them into those that had established efficacy and you could see similar um, similar medications of the triptans the NSAIDs but um, but this also includes newer acute medications which I'm I'm going to be talking about a little bit so there there are two new acute uh, treatment options in the past couple of years that have that have come out. Um, and just, you know, just as I'm going to be talking about all these new treatments, I think, um, you know, it's a lot to take in. Uh, I don't necessarily expect that you all are going to be prescribing these because probably if at the, they're at the point where they've, you know, you're considering these, you, you might be referring to neurology since that is an option, but I think it's good to know about, good to know about that there are ones with different mechanisms um, and potentially, you know, you might feel comfortable prescribing them for patients. So first, um, the, the one of the two uh, new acute medications is, is in the category of something we call DITANS. Um, DITANS, as the name suggests, are similar, have a similar mechanism to triptans, but slightly different. So they target a slightly different serotonin receptor. Um, and practically a major difference is that, um, as some of you may know, triptans cause vasoconstriction. Um, so that can be a big limitation in their use, particularly you know, for, for people with cardiovascular uh, risk factors or history of cardiovascular events, their triptans are contraindicated. And so diatans um, do not cause that vasoconstriction, so can be safely used in, in patients with cardiovascular disease. So that's that's a major difference. And this, um, this fills a, a gap of in care or in, in treatment options that we had. Um, so specifically, the, the diatan that was approved is called lasmitidan. It was approved two and a half years ago. There are various dosing, um, various doses to prescribe. It's just one tablet at the start of migraine, and studies showed that it was statistically significantly uh, superior to placebo um, in, in terms of pain freedom over two hours. 
So as I said, the, a big advantage of this new medication is that it can be used in patients with cardiovascular risk, and these, these patients were included in the, in the trials. Um, the downside of this medication is, is that the side effect profile, the, there, there can be fairly high percentage of patients who experience side effects, particularly dizziness and sedation, and it's high enough that actually patients are advised not to drive within eight hours of taking this medication. That's part of the FDA labeling. So certainly can be limiting um, for a lot of patients to not be able to drive within eight hours after taking it. Um, but there can still be ways to fit it into their, their regimen if they are taking it later in the day or in, on the weekends after they're home, um, or if they're taking it particularly as a backup for very severe migraines when they would just otherwise be lying in bed anyway. Um, it is uh, also with, with all of these new medications, we want to avoid it in pregnancy and lactation, um, which certainly that encompasses a fair amount of our migraine patients who are younger women. Um, but uh, hopefully, you know, in, in the future, we'll, we'll get a little bit more data on, on pregnancy with these new medications. So the second acute new acute medication uh, is in the category called G-PANS. These have a different mechanism than the triptans and the ditans, and I'll talk a little bit about CGRP later in the talk, but these, these are small molecule inhibitors of the CGRP receptor, um, which is involved with, with migraine. So it has a different mechanism, um, and these were approved in spring of 2020, uh, but at the start of the pandemic, there are two different options. Um, also shows, uh, been, been shown to, um, be superior to placebo with when looking at rates of two hour pain freedom. Um, these have a much lower risk of side effects compared to the ditans. Small percentage of patients uh, can experience nausea, fatigue, um, but it's it's these are generally pretty well tolerated. And these also don't cause vasoconstriction. So these can also be used in patients with a history of cardiovascular events. Um, there's also no risk of medication overuse, like with triptans, if, if someone's using medication frequent, uh, too frequently, it, it can cause worsening headaches, and that's not a concern with these. Um, the, main, the main thing to look out for is that sometimes there are medication interactions um, with these medications because they're, they're metabolized by the CYP3A4 pathway, so you just have to do an interaction check if patients are on other, um, other CYP3A4 inducers or inhibitors. We have these new treatment options. When when do we use them and when do you wanna consider it? Is it something that you should prescribe a migraine patient right off the bat when they first see you? Um, well, the American Headache Society guidelines from 2021 recommend that these be considered in patients who have tried and failed at least two oral triptans. And it might not take that long before you get to that point for a patient. Um, if they've either had side effects or they just don't get much benefit from the triptans, that's when you want to start thinking about using one of these new med newer medications. And as I've mentioned a couple of times, um, of course, in, in the population that is older or has cardiovascular risk factors, these, um, these, can be can be used safely, um, unlike triptans. Uh, these are not necessarily all newer treatments, but there are um, more and more non-oral options becoming available in different formulations. Um, so uh, just just important to note that uh, triptans and NSAIDs and you know all these all these first line medications for migraine do also come in non non oral formulations. Um, either nasal sprays or subcutaneous um, formulations. So, um, so that's also something that you can, can keep in your treatment arsenal. And then the, the last category of treatments for acute uh, treatment of migraine is, is neuromodulation. Neuromodulation devices is an area where we've also seen um, an explosion or a significant increase in research and development in the past 10 years or so. Um, and there are currently five neuromodulation devices approved for acute treatment of migraine or FDA cleared for acute treatment of migraine. Um, several of these are like a TENS unit, essentially a sub 
supraorbital tra uh, transcutaneous nerve stimulation, either in the, the pericranial nerves or remotely in the, as an armband. Um, so again, uh, probably unlikely that you will be prescribing one of these, but, but it's helpful just to know that these are out there, um, particularly in patients who you want to avoid medication um, in. Uh, I like using these in, in pregnant patients with migraine um, uh, or just patients who prefer a non-drug approach. Uh, there, there are these devices that, that can be used to treat migraine as needed. Cost is usually the limiting factor since they, they're not really covered by insurance, but, um, but it's important to, to recognize that, that these exist. Just a word on acute, uh, frequent acute medication use and medic medication overuse, because um, this, this definitely does come up when you're thinking about trying to, uh, trying to get someone an effective acute medication. Um, there's this concept of medication overuse headache where the idea is that medication overuse or frequent medic acute medication use actually leads to worsening migraines over time. It's sometimes difficult to draw the line between just what's medication overuse and what's actually at the point of medication overuse headache because it's it's hard to determine cause and effect. Or are the frequent medications actually leading to worsening headache or are the patient just having worsening migraines, so they're taking a lot of acute medications. But regardless, it's always important to counsel patients not to overuse acute medications um, simply for the fact that it can have other adverse effects like um, gastritis with overuse of NSAIDs or cardiovascular risk with overuse of triptans or NSAIDs. So, um, so it's important to always uh, counsel patients to, to try to minimize their use of, of acute medications and also if, if they are overusing acute medications, think about prevention, which we'll, we'll talk about next. Um, and so just to, just to kind of summarize and put things together for acute treatment, with all of these new options, uh, we, we can really build an attack toolbox for our migraine patients. Um, it's not uncommon for a patient um, seen in headache clinic to be on, uh, to have three or four different options um, because not all migraine attacks are the same, even in an individual patient. So, um, so it can be helpful to have different modalities and, and different approaches for, for, um, for migraines that, that can pop up at different times or, or have different characteristics. Um, I mentioned the non-oral options, and those, those are particularly helpful for patients with a lot of nausea and vomiting who can't keep down pills, or for patients with really sudden onset severe migraines who you want you want to have a medication that works quickly, uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and then, and then certainly, you know, there are ways to combine some of these different modalities um, to get, to get the best effects. Let's talk about prevention next. We've talked about acute as needed medication, and then uh, we'll be talking about prevention, some of the new preventive treatment options. Uh, so back to our patient, Maria is now very satisfied with her many acute treatment options, and she feels like she can more effectively treat the migraines as needed, but she'd still like to worry about her migraines less. She still feels like she's just having too many, too frequent migraines. She has asthma, so you're a little concerned about beta blockers, and she's heard that topiramate can make people kind of dopey, and she's a working mom. She really can't afford to have any slowed cognitive function. And so she wants to know about what are other options for migraine prevention. What is pr migraine prevention in the first place? Um, the kind of typical explanation, um, what I tell patients is that the goal of prevention is to reduce the frequency and severity of migraine. So it's not a cure, um, but the, the goal is really to get migraines down to a level that they're more manageable, that they can be um, effectively treated with an acute medication and that they don't, um, you know, they, they don't disrupt a patient's life. A, a, their patient can, can have confidence that they, they will not be, my severe migraine will not be popping up and, and having them miss important events. Um, uh, we talked about reducing frequent acute medication use. That's a, that can be a big goal of prevention. And actually, migraine prevention is, in a sense, disease modifying um, because we know that having frequent migraines is a major risk factor for progression of migraine into the, the chronic frequency, into 15 or more days of headache per month. So um, by effectively treating migraines, uh, effectively preventing migraines, we're, 
we're preventing um, progression of disease. When to offer prevention uh, can be somewhat of a, of a tricky question because it can, it definitely varies patient to patient and there's not necessarily always a, always one, one set uh, criteria. Um, but the takeaway from this slide is that you should probably think about migraine prevention earlier than you are. Um, and, uh, and the American Headache Society guidelines recommend that even if a patient is having just three headache days a month, if, if they are severe headaches that are disabling, um, prevention should be offered. Um, so, so you know, even less than one day a week, um, it, it, it can be helpful to, to think about prevention. Um, certainly if, if, um, if migraines are at the point where they're interfering with someone's life, they're missing work, um, if a patient has contraindications to acute treatments or just more limited in what acute medications they can take, or if they're overusing acute medications, definitely think about prevention. Um, but as I said, it can be it can be patient dependent, and for some patients, having uh, three migraines a month uh, that knock them out and and make them miss work, um, you know that patient is going to want want to start prevention, whereas someone who's having 10 migraine days a month that are much more mild and manageable might not really feel the need to, to start um, a prescription preventive. So, um, so it's important to, to just have that discussion with, with patients and, and figure out their, their preferences. So uh, there, there are certainly newer prescription preventive medications, um, but before diving into that, I, I always want to talk about non-pharmacologic approaches because I think this is still really important. And there have also there's also been new research and there are new studies being done on various non-pharmacologic uh, approaches. And and especially since a lot of migraine patients are younger and and not necessarily used to taking a daily medication, I, I find that a lot of my patients are interested in non-pharmacologic approaches or on the flip side, they're, they're older and they're already on a lot of medications and they don't necessarily want to add on another medication. Um, so it's important to know kind of where, what evidence is there for, for various non-pharmacologic treatments of migraine. Um, and I think especially on the, on the primary care side, um, many of these approaches can be helpful things to at least start with um, uh, before, before escalating to some of the, the stronger prescription medications. So the at the basis of migraine care is usually lifestyle modifications. And I try to review all of these things with, with patients when I, when I first evaluate them for migraine. So basic rule of thumb is keep it regular. The migraine brain likes things to be regular and stable. Uh, so making sure patients are getting regular sleep, ideally seven to eight hours, uh, keeping stress under control and keeping well hydrated, having a balanced diet, not skipping meals. Uh, moderate exercise has been shown to be helpful for preventing uh, migraine progression. So, um, so all these factors are important to, to try to address at least. Um, I often like focusing on, like if I had to choose one of these, I, I would focus on sleep because I think that that is in a, in a sense, a bit more modifiable than, than um, some other things like stress. Uh, so so if, if I had to pick one of these to kind of delve into, I, I often um, spend a little bit more time talking about sleep. Um, so this sort of is, is very important, is, is just as important, I think, as, as medications to, um, to go through these at some point. Other non-pharmacologic approaches, uh, there are various nutraceuticals or supplements that have evidence in migraine. And this table summarizes all of the ones that have studies and evidence for, for um, uh, this comes from a nice review article. Um, practically, the, the two that I use most, most uh, are riboflavin and magnesium. And um, I, again, I think these are good if you just have familiarity with like one or two of these, um, especially for in the primary care setting, I think at least starting, if nothing else, if, if you kind of recommend these for a patient to take and uh, it can be a, a useful first step. Um, and, and again, can be useful in, in patients who are younger and don't really want to be on a prescription medication or in elderly patients who you want to avoid prescription medications, this can be um, a good option. 
there are also several behavioral and complementary therapies that that have evidence for migraine. Um, so these are important to, to keep in mind as well. And I think patients, patients I see are often very interested in, in these and kind of come in with the question of, well, what complementary treatments can I use? And I think people are becoming more and more familiar and it's becoming more um, kind of ingrained in, in medical practice. So there's, there's good level of evidence, uh, level A evidence for cognitive behavioral therapy, biofeedback, um, has been used for many years for, for migraine treatment. Um, and then there's also studies showing benefit of mindfulness-based stress reduction, acupuncture, um, practically as, as many of you are familiar with the, the main act, uh, the main barrier to these treatments is often access. Getting behavioral treatment is, is challenging for patients. So, so I often, um, suggest for for patients uh, that they look into mindfulness meditation. I think a lot of patients at this point have have heard of mindfulness meditation at least. Um, and it's it's a bit more accessible, a lot of free resources out there, apps and websites. So um, so I often, you know, I state that there is there are studies and there is evidence for the benefit of mindfulness meditation in migraine. Um, and 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 that's a common one that I recommend. And behavioral, th these sorts of complementary behavioral therapies can be particularly important for, for patients who have high stress, poor, co st poor stress coping skills, um, and also for patients who just want to avoid medications for, um, particularly pregnant patients. Um, it's important to kind of optimize all the non-pharmacologic approaches we can. And next we'll talk about pharmaco pharmacotherapy. Um, new new migraine medications. Um, basic principles of preventive treatment uh, is that we, you know, we start patients on, on a certain preventive treatment and we want to make sure we give it enough time. Any preventive treatment can take up to two to three months to work. Um, always want to reevaluate, like typically if someone's been doing well in a preventive treatment, we might want to think about coming off of it. Um, so, so that's kind of generally the pattern, no matter what, what treatment we use. Um, the American Academy of Neurology has also not really put out more recent guidelines for preventive medications. The guidelines from 2012 um, list what are typically still first-line preventive medications for migraine. So, so typically, we, we start people on these older non- migraine specific medications like topiramate or beta blockers. Um, it's interesting to know, you know, one thing that people find interesting is that amitriptyline or tricyclic antidepressant, which is often first line, actually has a slightly lower level of evidence compared to topiramate or, or beta blockers. So um, just something to note, but, but typically ones in, in these, like I, I typically start either a topiramate beta blocker or a tricyclic antidepressant as, as first line. Um, and these all have good level of evidence. The main downside being, as, as we discussed earlier, um, these, these have a lot of issues with tolerability. Side effects um, can just be diff diff difficult to take a, a daily medication. So, um, so oftentimes adherence is, is not very good. Um, the American Headache Society, more recent, uh, the, the 2021 guidelines um, do list many of the newer preventive treatment medications, including onabotulinum toxin A or Botox, which, which is approved for chronic migraine specifically. Um, but uh, this, these guidelines also include some of the newer CGRP targeted treatments, which I'll talk talk about um, in a bit. Um, interesting to note that in the established efficacy category, um, they listed candesartan. So candesartan is actually, um, there's several studies showing benefit for prevention of migraine. Um, so can be relevant for primary care doctors if your patient has hypertension and migraine, maybe think about candesartan. So I mentioned CGRP uh, several times. What is CGRP and why, why are there CGRP treatments for migraine? CGRP stands for calcitonin gene-related peptide. It's a neuropeptide that is located in various parts of the body, but, but located in, um, in, the, in the central nervous system um, as well. And it's, uh, it 
it is involved with vasodilation. It's located on blood vessel walls, and it, we know it's involved with um, pain signaling of, of migraine. It's, it's located in the trigeminal nerves. Um, and, and there are various lines of evidence that CGRP is involved with migraine. Uh, and so knowing this, they, there was development of medications that block CGRP to try to treat migraine. Um, so the first, so I mentioned in the acute medication portion of the talk that there were these new acute medications called GPANS. Those were actually the first ones to be um, studied. These are small molecule inhibitors, so they're orally um, absorbed. Um, and they block the CGRP receptor. And then a little bit later um, came the development of anti-CGRP monoclonal antibodies. So these are large molecules, so they can't be absorbed orally. They have to be uh, parentally administered. Um, and, uh, and these were really the first CGRP targeted treatments to be FDA approved. Um, these are, uh, these either bind to and, and block the CGRP peptide itself or the CGRP receptor, um, and they're all uh, parenteral. So these are the four that are approved. Three are given subcutaneously with, with an injector every month, um, and, and there's one that is uh, an IV infusion every three months. Um, they, they all have similar half-lives of about a month, um, and they all have been shown to have efficacy um, for treating both episodic and chronic migraine, so migraine of all frequencies. Um, and, and there's really not one that's clearly more efficacious than another based on at least based on the, the individual phase three trials. Um, these medications, a big advantage because they're more targeted um, than some of the older preventive medications like topiramate, they tend to have a, a, low, a lower rate of side effects. Um, in the trials, really the main side effects for the injectables were injection site reactions, redness swelling around the injection site. Um, arenumab specifically can cause constipation. Um, uh, so in, in a patient with constipation, we're sometimes a little bit... Uh, we might want to do one of the other ones, but um, but otherwise, you know, there aren't aren't a lot of other side effects, um, at least in in high enough numbers to to be significant. Um, so, when would we use one of these monoclonal antibodies, these CGRP inhibitors? Um, so, all of these all of these new medications, I should say, have just been approved for adults. Uh, there are there are studies occurring for children, but, um, but these are all currently just FDA approved for adults. Um, and they, they could be considered, they should be considered again, that magic number of two trials. So if someone's tried at least two older preventive medications like topiramate or beta blockers, then, um, and, and they failed it for whatever reason, either couldn't tolerate it or, or had contraindications or uh, just wasn't effective, that's when you want to start thinking about some of these newer treatments. So again, you might at this point, if you're seeing a patient with migraine who's tried a couple of different preventives, you might be thinking on a neurology consult and that would be totally reasonable. But if you, you know, ever, I, I've definitely seen a lot of primary care doctors um, uh, be uh, prescribing these medications because they have pretty low side effect profile. They're pretty easy to administer. Um, so, uh, so, you know, it, it might not take that long before a patient will qualify for one of these medications. Uh, this is an inter this is a study basically accumulating all the data across the trials for these various CGRP monoclonal antibodies. The purpose of this slide is, is to compare, the purpose of the study was to compare it to the efficacy of some older treatments like topiramate, you know, are these are the numbers we're seeing in these trials really that different from some of the older treatments? And, and basically it's not. Um, uh, so you might ask, well, why, you know, what's the purpose of these medications if they're not any more efficacious? Um, well, I think one reason um, that, that should be clear is that they are much better tolerated. Um, and so the adherence should be much higher and patients would actually be able to stay on these long enough to see effects. Um, but actually, you know, I'd say in practice, we're seeing that these are more, more efficacious than the studies would suggest. And, and this was a, a recent study that, uh, to my knowledge, is the first study that's actually a head-to-head -head comparison between one of the 
one of the CGRP antibodies and topiramate, an older preventive medication. And, and their primary outcome was, was tolerability. Um, and you can see here that, that this is looking at rates of, of discontinuation and, and a, significant, a significantly higher percentage of patients on the topiramate discontinued it with, within four months, so close to 40% um, versus 10% in irenumab. So clearly, this is much better tolerated than topiramate. Um, and, and interestingly, they uh, found that there was a, there was a significant um, advantage in efficacy of arenumab versus topiramate. Um, so over 50% of patients on arenumab had at least a 50% reduction in their headache frequency as opposed to 30% with topamax. So definitely, um, definitely shows a head-to-head -head comparison that it was more, more effective. So, um, and I'd say that that comports with what we're seeing in practice, um, that these can be quite effective for a lot of patients. And then the newest kit on the block in terms of migraine prevention are the G-Pants. And you might say, well, what we just talked about G-Pants, that sounds familiar. Um, that Yes, G-Pants were originally approved for acute treatment of migraine. Um, these are those small molecule inhibitors that, that bind to the CGRP receptor. Um, but more recently, G-Pants were also approved for prevention. Um, and, and so this, uh, and, and so these are pills, um, that are for prevention, they're dosed either, uh, one is every other day and one is daily. Um, and so it, it's nice because it offers a CGRP targeted treatment. That's an oral option. So for patients who don't want to have an, don't want to use an injection, don't want to inject themselves, um, many are, are preferring G pants um, as, as an alternative. And, and these also have a low, low rate of side effects with nausea and constipation um, being probably the most common ones we're seeing. So, um, so these, these are now yet another uh, new option we have for, for prevention. Just a word about these CGRP treatments. There are a lot of benefits. They haven't, they've been around now for over three years, so we have a good amount of data on their use, but CGRP is not just involved with migraine. It's, it's located in various areas in the body, including the GI tract, which is why um, the, the most common side effect tends to be things like nausea and constipation. So could there be longer term effects of blocking CGRP that we're just not aware of? Um, hard to know, um, given that they haven't been out for that long. These are involved with vasodilation. So CGR, these, these CGRP medications do not specifically cause vasoconstriction, but there's some concern that by blocking CGRP and blocking vasodilation, if a patient were to have a cardiovascular event like an MI or stroke, that potentially they wouldn't be able to have the compensatory vasodilation they need. This is not yet borne out um, in practice or, or come up in any studies, but, um, but it, I'm a little bit more cautious with these treatments in patients with, uh, who are older or have a cardiovascular, um, history. So, uh, just something to note. Um, also we are seeing higher rates of some of the GI's side effects like constipation, um, with, uh, specifically a renumab, um, one of the monoclonal antibodies and with the G pants, we're seeing higher rates than, than we were seeing in the trial. So um, also in a patient with history of GI issues or constipation, um, you wanna be a little bit more careful with these. And then all of these treatments are currently contraindicated in pregnancy because they are new. Um, we just don't know the effects. There are now registries that are, are set up to monitor um, outcomes in pregnant women who who take who are exposed to these medications. So hopefully we will have more data in the next few years, but currently um, they should not be prescribed in pregnant women and, and for the injectables, which which stick around longer, you wanna make sure that this is stopped at least five months in advance of potentially getting pregnant. Um, neuromodulation, as with acute treatment, can also be used preventatively for migraine. Three, there are three devices, so not quite as many devices, but, but three of the devices have both an acute and a preventive function. So this is also a, a tool we have in our toolbox for patients who we, who we want to avoid medications in as much as possible. 
And then I, I could give a whole talk on procedures. So it's not, not the purpose of this talk, but just also to um, not neglect procedures, which certainly are um, an important part of, of our treatment of migraine. On a botulinum toxin A or Botox, many of you are probably familiar with its, its use in migraine. This is specifically approved for chronic migraine. So a patient has to have at least 15 days a month of headache, um, but that is, is a very effective, quite effective treatment for migraine. And, and typically if someone's tried at least two preventive medications and they have chronic migraine, I'll kind of lay out the, the options or the branch point as being on a botulinum toxin A or a CGRP targeted treatment. Um, and then, and, you know, in the headache clinic, we also perform, and, and, and many neurologists also perform uh, nerve blocks and other, other procedures um, to both treat migraines acutely and, and sometimes uh, preventatively. Uh, there's certainly a lot of uh, good evidence for use of onobotulinum toxin A, and, and there's a strong recommendation for its use. Um, there's not quite as strong evidence for some of these other procedures. Um, so uh, definitely more, more data is, is needed, but we, we do find it you know, anecdotally and in practice useful for, um, for certain patients. All right, that was a bit of a whirlwind, um, and I hope I, I left enough time for, for questions um, to, uh, to clarify anything or, or to, um, to expound upon anything that, that you were more interested in. But I hope you come away with, with a few major points um, that there are really now so many uh, different acute and preventive medications and treatments that we can offer our migraine patients. There have been um, several new medications that have been developed in the last few years that are more targeted, have better tolerability. Um, so it's, it's really a, a lot more that we can offer our patients. Um, and with all these options, you want to think about building a toolbox, thinking about the, the patient in front of you and, and what, what, uh, what gaps in their treatment um, are, are present and, and what needs uh, can be filled by these new, newer treatments. Um, and, and always don't forget non-pharmacologic approaches, um, uh, which, which can be just as important, if not more important than than, than medication. So think about behavioral or complementary therapies, devices, procedures, all of these can be, um, can be options for, for migraine patients and, and might be a reason to think about referring to um, a neurologist or a specialist.